put plus seven is equal to zero. Yet when we solve it, what happens is our x is actually, you get 5x squared equals negative 7, and then x squared equals negative 7 over 5. You would get in imaginary numbers. And that's not in the domain of all real numbers. So based on that, what we can assume is that this is the domain would be negative infinity comma positive infinity. So this is our domain. And then our range. So for our range, what we would have here is, we would have your own. Um, so in order to solve for y, we're taking um, the limit as x approaches infinity of this function over here. And from this, we know we can use the ignore rule because the exponents are the same level. So it would just be 3 over 5. So from here, we get y is equal to 3 over 5. And then for our range, what we would have here is 0 is less than or equal to x. And then that would be, um, what do you call it, less than 3 over 5, I believe. Or, um, yes. And then another range would, actually, no, that would be a range. So then for b, what we are told to find here is... Hold on a second. A, yes. I'm here. Okay. So it's from zero because we have square in the numerator, square in oh, the yes. denominator. Oh, yes. I forgot to say that. Yes. Right. So it's good. So when, when, when x equals zero, will we ever get to be zero? When x is zero. Okay. Um, what, about, what about above three over five? Not three over five. What about one? Um, for one, you're saying, Professor? Yeah, the range. The range, we have this. Let me see. Let me use it. So you use a so, limit. You take the limit. You find out the horizontal asymptotes. Yes. Horizontal asymptotes is y equals 3 over 5. Yes, Professor. So that means this value won't be in the range. And also, you observed we have an even function. So even function, the least value is 0. What yes. about the value above 3 over 5? Oh, I see. Um, yeah. So for the value above 3 over 5, um, so we're talking about y values here. Yeah, the range, right. Well, as I'm looking at this graph, I see that it never goes really above. It stays below. It's basically below three over five. Yeah. Oh right, right. You are right. So it would um yeah it would go to um zero and it would never hit negative side. It would just hit the um what do you call it the y no the x axis and from x axis to three over five this is the range. That's right. That's right. Because I was thinking if we get a very very small number. Yeah. And once I draw the graph, you'll see. Okay. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Okay. So right. our so next step. Horizontal asymptotes, y equals the 3 over 5. And we have an even function. If it's an oh, yes. odd function, it's a different. Right. We have an even function here. You're right. Go ahead. So, um, oh, wow. We already um, solved for number 2. This is our horizontal asymptote. y equals 3 over 5. There are no um, vertical asymptotes. So this right over here is our horizontal asymptote. Okay, um, now C. For C, we're told to find the critical numbers. So first, what we have to do is find the derivative of this. So our y prime, that would be equal to the derivative of this. So um, 6x times the bottom function, 5x squared plus 7. And 
then subtract it from this times the derivative of this. So 3x squared. The derivative of 5x squared plus 7 is 10x. And then all of this would be over our bottom function squared. So 5x squared plus 7 squared. So then from here, just to save time, when you um, simplify this, what you would get here is, you see you get here 42x over 5x squared plus 7 squared. So from here, all we would do is set this function equal to zero. And we know that the bottom function would be undefined. We're looking for defined here. So 42x, if you were to set that equal to zero, we will get that x is equal to zero. So from here, what we know is that for our c, that's asking us to find the critical numbers. Our critical numbers would be at x is equal to zero. And that's the only one. And then next, d. For d, we're told to find the intervals where the function increases and decreases. So as we saw before, um, we had, what do you call it? Yes, we, we've solved for x and we know that it's zero. So what we know is that um, if we go left away, if we um, go towards the negative side, we have your negative infinity comma um, zero. And if we go towards the right, we have zero comma positive infinity. So these are our intervals. So um, I'm just going to put a D for decreasing. So for decreasing, we would have here negative infinity to zero. And then for increasing, you would have your um, zero to positive infinity. Uh, how do we know that from, from, how do we know that if we don't, do not have the graph? Because for this kind of question, we're supposed to find out all this, then to graph it. Um, we what's the question, to, Professor? Oh. How, how do we find out the intervals of increasing and decreasing? Well, um, without looking at the graph, but to go from here, from the derivative function. Oh, the, the derivative function? Right. So, if it is in the interval of increasing, that means we choose, so we have two, so we have one critical point. So we split into two intervals. Yes, it's um, zero comma zero. That's the critical point. Right. So the interval of x value from negative infinity up to zero, then from zero up to positive infinity. So how do we use this interval and the a function of derivative function to find out the original function increase in the interval or decrease in the interval? Um. Remember, we choose a value. Here, we can choose a negative 1. Oh, yes. Now I know what you mean. I remember. We have to um, approximate. Yeah. Right. So we'll put this negative 1 into this derivative function. So negative 1, that would be 3 over 5 plus 7. 
Oh wait, no, we're supposed to plug well, in here. Right, we're supposed to yeah. plug into f of prime. Let me see, five plus seven, twelve, square, one forty four, negative forty two over one forty four. Right, so we'll be less than zero. Yeah. And then for um positive one, forty two over one forty four. So right. greater. Right. Yeah. So the derivative but the derivative at negative one is negative. So we know from negative infinity up to zero, the original function decreases. Yes. So the same thing for positive, right, that increases. Okay, good, keep going. Okay, um, our next is um, part E. So from part E, what we're told is, I mean, number six. No, num number five, sorry. We're told to find inflection points. So in order to find inflection points, we have to um, set the second derivative equal to zero. So we have to find the derivative of this right over here. So once again, we use the quotient rule. It's the 42 times the bottom function. It's 42 is the derivative. minus the top function um, times the derivative of the bottom function. Once again, that's 10x. And then all of this over the bottom function squared. So just to save time, I'm just going to simplify this quickly. So when you do all of this, sorry, um, when you do all of this math over here, what you would get is f double prime is equal to negative 630 x squared plus 294. over um, the bottom function squared. And all you do here is set this equal to zero. The denominator is undefined. We're looking for defined here. So we would set negative 630x squared plus 294 equal to zero. function and just to save time I'm going to give the solutions so our solutions would be you'd have your negative square root of 105 over 15 that's our x one of our x's and we will also have a positive square root of 105 over 15 and i'm also going to write the y values when you substitute them and then be the same thing for this one as well. Okay, so from here, what we're told is find the inflection points. So our inflection points, um, what we just solved for right over here, these are inflection points. So let me just put an E right over here. And then next, um, Six, find the intervals where the function is concave up and concave down. So the intervals where a function would be concave up and concave down. So we're using these values that we just solved for negative square root 105 over 15 and the positive version. 
So um, it will be concave down. So let me write F for number six. So for concave down, what we have here on the interval from negative infinity up to um, the negative version of this. Okay. How do we know that? Um, wouldn't we test a value that's um, less than this? We're going, right, we're using, we substitute, right, we substitute into the second derivative function. Then we check to see if we choose a value, let's say this is the negative square root of 105 over 15. And then we know for sure this is less than, that's bigger than negative one. So we may choose negative one here again. Yes, and there's actually, um, there's actually yeah. a second interval as well that's um, also concave down when you test it. So exactly. we have here positive square root of 105 over 15 up to positive infinity. Right, you use one to check that, like yes. in the second derivative function. The same idea, if you're in the interval, the second, if we choose a value in the interval, if the second derivative function, the value of it is positive, that means concave up. Negative means concave down. Now for um for concave up, professor, we yeah. have your we have your in between these values. So we have your negative oh, okay. square right, root of split, yeah. yeah, we have a split into four intervals. From negative yes. infinity up to this negative value. Then from this negative value up to the positive value. Then from the positive value up to positive infinity. Three intervals. Yes, Professor. Mm -hmm. And then finally, our last part is just to graph this function. Um, yeah, I don't really have space here. I don't. Um, it's okay. It's okay. And okay. let me just show the general shape, though. So the general shape, it would be, um, I don't know if you can see that. The general shape would look something like this. If you could see my graph here. Actually, it would be slightly lower than this. Let's say this right over here is 3, y is equal to 3 over 5. Let's just say this. This would be our horizontal asymptote right over here. Okay. Okay. This question is very tedious, um, but it's really helpful to help us to understand why we, you know, how do we use it, uh, all those domain range critical points, inflection points, can keep up, can keep down, increase and decrease, and to help us to graph. And uh, uh, thank you, Amir. Anybody has any question? OK, so thank you, Amir. I can share my graph. OK, and this is question 30, just to hear. OK, let me share my screen to show the graph. Yeah, if I use I use decimals, so this is a graph. So you see this line is a three over five. So it's a uh, little here. So it's a uh, horizontal asymptotes. So if we room in, if we room in, oops. Then we see the we see the count keep down, so so decreases from negative infinity up to zero. The function decreases from zero up to positive infinity. The function increases, but it only increases um, does not pass the line three over five. Y value equals three over five. The horizontal asymptotes. Then we see the critical points only this point the origin. Then 
concave up, we see this is a concave up, 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 up. There's somewhere here, you see um, the graph going down. Yeah, can you I, see? Um, I converted the um, square root to decimal. If you were to zoom around 0 0.68, I believe, you would see yeah, the change. Somewhere here. somewhere here, right? You see it going up, the cup going cup up, cup up, cup up, cup up. Somewhere here starting cup down, cup down, cup down, cup down, cup down. All right. Okay, anyone has questions over this? Okay, next one. Uh, I mean, anybody else wants to show anything, any homework or has questions? Um, on uh, any review sheet, any questions on the review sheet or the question or on the homework? Okay, Victoria wants to try 37. Great. I hope we can finish the review sheet. Okay, Victoria. All right, Van can present another one, great. Thirty-three, thirty-seven, thirty-forty. So not many questions left, right? Okay, so this is Victoria's 37. Victoria? Yes, I'm sorry, I had a connection problem. Okay. Can you see my work now? Yeah. Um, so my question is number 37, and the question is, the cone has a radius of five feet and a height of 15 feet. It is empty and is being filled with water at a constant rate of 12 feet cube per second. It asks to find the rate of, rate of change of the radius of the surface of the water and the radius of the surface of the water is two feet. So um, with this, I use similar triangles where in the, you can see in the picture on the right where I put uh, radius over height is similar to um, five over 15. Then I solve for H um, for the height to get H is equal to three R. Then we know that volume is one third times pi R squared times height. And, and I substituted H as three R so you get volume is equal to pi r cubed. Then I will differentiate both sides. So it will be dv over dt is equal to pi times d over dt times r cubed. Since um, you could take out the pi because it's a constant, then um, you, will, you will isolate dr over dt. To, then you will get dr over dt is equal to uh, 12 over pi times 3, 4. Then you could I eliminate 12 from the top and the bottom, then you will get dr over dt is equal to 1 over pi uh, feet per second, and that's the rate of the change of the radius of the surface of the water. Okay, so what is the idea behind this kind of question? Um, it's a really 
Related rates question. Right, related rates question. Right. Uh, anyone has any questions about this? So let me ask you one more question. Why do we need to do this? Why do we need to find the similar triangles to find the relation between H and R? Because we're given the full uh, the height and radius of the uh, cone, but we have to find the increasing rate of the water as it increases up the cone. So if we because use similar we function, yes, because we need a function, we know this. Um, we have this volume equation to work with, but we have two. We have uh, two variables here. Yeah, we have two variables. We have R square and H. Yeah, we have R and H as unknown, so we have to find one of the variables. Right. So we want to reduce to be a single, single variable. Yes. So I the found H and substituted in the volume equation. Right. Great. Very neat. Okay. Um, anyone has any questions? So this is related rates question and for sure will be on the exam, right? Okay, great. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you. Okay, next one. Okay, this is uh, bonds Very neat. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so I did number 33, and the first part asked to find the area between the two functions, uh, y equals 2x and y equals 2x squared minus 4. Um, I first graph the two functions together and um, I equaled 2x equals 2x squared minus 4 to find the plot, uh, the x points. Um, so we could put it into integral. What is the x point? The, the, um, the intersecting x points. Uh, you mean the value, there's no yeah, yeah. x point. You mean the x value? The x value, sorry. Okay. Um, so to find the area, um, I subtracted the top uh, minus which the... How do you find the x value of the intersection point? Uh, excuse me, what did you say? I said, you haven't finished tell, telling us how do you find the x value of the intersection points. Oh, sorry. Um, I put 2x equals to 2x squared minus 4, and then I uh, subtracted 2x on both sides, so I get 0. And then I um, factored 2 out of the 
2x squared minus 2x minus 4 to get 2x squared minus x minus 2. And then I factored it again. And then I equaled it to 0 to get x equals 0, 2, and negative 1. Um, okay. What kind of equation is this? Let me, let me circle this. What kind of equation is this? Um, that's just to get the x values. I know, but in mathematics, do you know the name of this equation? This is a quadratic equation, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Quadratic, okay, all right, keep going. Now you have the x value for the two intersects. So we know the two functions intersect at x value here at x value here. All so right. Negative, negative one and two. Yeah. So to find the area, we subtract the top function minus the bottom function, which is 2x minus 2x squared minus 4. And so then we find the antiderivative, uh, which is 2x squared over 2 minus 2x to the third over 3 minus 4x. And then we simplify that to x squared minus 2 third x to the third plus 4x. And then we substitute 2 for x and then minus that. And then we substitute negative 1 also. And then we simplify everything to get a the area equals 9. OK, can you tell me how did you get, how did you go from this step to this step? So once you have this x value, how do you use this x value? So since... Oh, hold on a second. Is x equals 0 a solution of this quadratic equation? How many solutions a quadratic equation has? Here you have 0, 2, negative 1. You have 3. Is 0 a solution for this quadratic equation? Oh, no, it's not because it doesn't intersect with the other function. Right, and also you can you can check here, right? If we plug in 0 into this equation, we get left-hand side 0, but right-hand right side negative 4. So 0 is not. So this is typo, right? Okay, yeah, there is, yeah, sorry. Right. It's okay. So how do we use these two values? X equals negative 1 and 2. So just explain to me from this step to the next step, from, to the area, to this one. Um, since we're finding the area, we have negative 1 and 2. So So you see the x value, right? x value, right? we find out that you can make the 1, which is here, and the 2 is here. So how do we use these two x values? What does it mean? OK, basically, my question is this. Basically, my question is, you know, when you write area equals to this thing, what does this mean, the one in the red color? A circle with red color. Can you see it? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, what does this pair mean? So this is an integration from negative 1 up to 2 on x-axis. What does this mean to you? That we're trying to find the area in between those two certain points. You're, try, you're trying to find the area of this region you shaded, right? Yeah. Right. So now I'm asking you, what is this? What does this pair mean to you? You see this integration sign. The low, the lower limit is negative one. Upper limit is two. Then dx. What does this mean to you?
the inside we call integral. The integral you said, okay, use the upper function, subtract the lower function, which is great. You explained. So what does this integration mean? From negative one, so from negative one, which is here, let me write it here. So the x value negative one here, up to two. So what does this pair mean to you? Um. Well, what is this whole thing doing here? What is this whole, the area equals this? What does the whole thing mean to you? Um, it, it means that we're finding the, the shaded area where the two function intersect. That's exactly right. So this R, but how are we finding it? What does this integration sign? The integrand and this dx mean to you? Hmm. So what does integral mean? What does this this mean? This you know, it's like a pole long S. Um that's for uh that's for antiderivatives. The antiderivatives, okay, what does antiderivative, okay, you can understand as antiderivative. So if we put a negative one up to two, so lower limit is negative one, upper limit is two, so what does this pair, what, is, what does this mean, this pair mean? Integration from negative one up to two dx. It means this, right? It means from negative one up to two, we cut, we cut the x value into infinite many pieces. Then we approximate each triangle, right? We have this y, so this integrand give us, so integration from negative one to two dx means from negative one to two, we cut into infinite many pieces. So for each piece, we multiply by its height, which comes from this integral. So we get a triangle, right? Area of a triangle. Not a triangle, right? Area of a rectangle. Then we add up all the areas of this rectangle. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay. Okay. So this is from the Riemann sum, right? So first we cut into n pieces. Then we let n run to infinity. That means we cut into infinite many pieces. So we use this elongated s. So the elongated s from negative one to two dx. That means the x value from negative one to two we cut into infinite many pieces. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Keep going. Keep your volume. Oh. Um. So now we have we find when the region um goes rotates around the x-axis, and so similar to the area formula, but instead we use um, v equals pi r squared, and for r, we do um, um, 2x squared minus 2x squared minus 4 to the square root, I mean to the square power. And then we, um, and then when you square it, we get 4x squared minus 4x to the fourth minus 16x squared plus 16. And then we find the antiderivative, which is negative 4 fifths x to the fifth plus 20 
over 3x to the third minus 16x. And then we substitute x for 2 and negative 1. Then we subtract, subtract the 2. And then we get negative 72 over 5 pi. Um, and then for the third part, we okay. are fine. Yeah, hold on a second. Can you explain this volume? How do you get this volume? Just explain it, not to read it. What, what's the idea behind this? Oh, so uh, the function, um, the area is rotating around the x-axis, and that part is r, the radius. And um, um, since... Um, since it's the radius, we have to take the top minus the top squared minus the bottom squared, which is that. Uh, you, is it possible for you to draw the three D picture? I could try, but mm -hmm. I. I could, I could try. Okay, so this one is a little bit complicated. It's um, easier to rotate over x equals uh, y equals negative four, but it's difficult to rotate with x axis. X axis. So this point would be around here, and then since this, um. We were rotating over x axis. Um, right. Okay, I tried. I I'm not very good at all right. We rotate it with x axis. Right, that means we get a symmetric region with a, a line of symmetry at x axis. So you see this point here, this is a two comma four. That would be two comma negative four, right? Mm -hmm. So reflect. And this line will reflect to be this. So this part would be this. And this, so this line will be reflected to be this one. This point reflected to be this point. What about this point? Can you tell me the oh. reflection of this point and this point? Then we will be able to graph. Okay. But don't you over x axis. But we don't we don't connect the these two points like this way. Not yet, but let's. Oh. Not yet. Okay, you are ahead of me. So you see, this point is being reflected. This point. Let me mark this one. So this one. Can you show us the reflection of this point? Of this one. Point. So mark the important points. Then we can draw the symmetric picture. Because we're rotating over x axis. So it's a reflection over x axis. So this point, when we reflect over x axis, becomes this point. And this point becomes this point. Great. And so next four, now we're going to, yes. Okay. Now, can you draw the picture? You draw the symmetric picture. Okay. You see here, it's like this. Yeah, so here it's like that. Great. And then from this point to that point, looks like this. Okay. 
right? She's a drag color, right? Yeah, okay. This is a little bit complicated. Okay. All right. So then when we rotate, like you said, okay. So explain your radius now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so for the third part, um, we're rotating around the y axis instead of the x. And to find the volume for the rotation around the y axis, we have to um, isolate x from the, the functions. And so we take y equals 2x, and that turns into x equals y over 2. And y equals 2x squared minus 4 turns into square root of 1 half y plus 2. Why um, do we do that? Why do we need, why we need to write, you know, y equals 2x or y equals 2x squared minus 4? Because y. OK, so because so our function goes like this, right? Can you draw the picture of a rotating with y axis? OK. Because um, the difficult part is to find the radius. You know, once we find the radius, you use pi r square, we set up the integral. Good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful. So uh, when it's rotating around the y-axis, right, uh, we, the radius would be going horizontal instead. So like that. And um, since it's going horizontal, uh, we need to use the x values instead of y. Good job. So we um, xr minus x left. So yeah. the x value on the right, x minus x value on the left. Great. Okay. So to find the y values, we already found um, x equals, and you don't need this, x equals 2 and negative 1, and I just substitute those values into the y formulas, 2x and 2x squared minus 4, and we get 4 and negative 2, so those are our y values. And so we uh, plug it into v, with the integral from negative 2 to 4, and then pi, uh, th and the radius would be the right function, which is square root of 1 half y plus 2 squared minus y over 2 squared. Uh, you simplify that, and then you find the antiderivative. And then you plug in x, I mean y for 4 and negative 2. And we get v equals 9 pi. OK, great. All right. So when we cut in right along, the when we rotate with y axis, the radius is the x value, right? So it's the x right minus yeah. x left. Okay, good job. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see next one. So we finished. I think we still have a couple of questions, right? Oh, sure. Right, try 18. Okay, Amir, we have 18, 21, 24. Thank you so much. What, do you have so many? Wow. Great. Let me, thank you, Amir. That means, you know, for those of you who do not get full credits for presentation yet, you still have, you still have uh, those questions to try. Let me make you present this.
Okay, anybody else like to try? It's okay, we'll wait for you. And anybody else? I see some of you haven't got a full credits um, presentation yet. So I think you ought to take this opportunity to, to try. I'm not, you know, I'm not um, expecting you to do perfectly. Right? If you're stuck here and there, I'll help you to understand what's going on. So while we're waiting for Henning, so today is a three. And uh, we have one more class, right? I think a seventh is our last class. Seventh is our last class on my calendar. Then your final exam will be on 14th, which is Monday after. What about 10? I don't think, do we have a 10? Do we have a class at 10? I think seven is the last class. Let me check the Hunter calendar. Uni calendar actually. Yeah, for 10, final, it's a final exam starting 10 to, so December 10 to 20, it's a full final exam. But our exam is set on 14th. So we're not going to meet on 10th. So next class, next Monday is our last class. Right, so 14, the same time. I'll make an announcement on CUNY Blackboard. All right, Hine, I see your work. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, so this is also another one of the related rates problem. They give you a cone with a radius of 18 and a height of 54, and it's being filled with water at the rate of 26 feet cube per square i mean per second and you have to find the rate of change for the radius of the surface when the water is at seven feet when the radius of the surface of the water is seven feet and they give you the the volume equation which is which they give is r square h pi over three and since i was kind of confused about this if i can do it or not but since um, you have the cone, you can kind of set up a proportion to find the height when the radius of the water is at seven. So I got the height as 21. And then to um, make the equation into like, to have less variable, you can plug in H as 21. And then from there, you can find the 
the derivative of it. So it would be dv over dt equal to 7 pi 2 r dr because the r square is 2r. And then you have to attach the dr dt. So you can plug in all the information you have, which is 26 for dv over dt. And then um, 7 for the radius of the water. And we're finding dr over dt, so we don't know that. And you do the math, and you get 26 over 98 pi. That's yeah. dr over dt. Yeah. OK. I think you were confused from, let me mark. You were confused from here. They crossed the out out. They started with this. But let me tell you, both ways are good. You could just take this equation, saying, OK, I'm going to do related rates, where right? I have three variables. So I'm going to you know, attach related rates, the derivative with each of the variable. You can go from there. But then you have to deal with product rule, because you have r squared h. So it's a little bit more work. But then what is dh dt? Right, dh dt will treat it as a constant. So dh dt will be dh dt will be zero. You could go from there by applying uh, implicit differentiation, or like you said, okay, you observed r and h are closely related by the similar triangles. Okay, you better draw a related triangle. I mean, similar triangles to convince yourself about the relation of R and H, like a Victoria had. Do you see this triangle? Yeah. Let me, let me draw this in red color. You have that triangle, then you have this triangle. Those are two similar triangles. So similar triangles, the corresponding side have the same ratio. Then you can set up this ratio, right? Yeah, I was confused okay. about it because I was trying it the first way and there were like too many variables. I didn't know that dh over dt could be zero. So I was like, yeah, because, because in the given in the given condition is seen at the moment. At the moment, right? Because we're only trying to find the the changing in in but later on we'll learn this idea is partial derivatives. But usually we go this way, we reduce one variable. We reduce the other variable. So we are, so like here, you're able to make a function V in terms of R. That's the purpose. All right, does that clear your confusion? Yeah. Thank okay, you. you're welcome. Anybody else has any questions? This is related rates. It could be complicated, but it could be very simple also. You know, all this, all those applications were trying to form a function to work with. We're trying to form a function to work with. Usually we have more variables than one. So we need to reduce, reduce the other variable to come up with a function. All right, okay, thank you, Henning. All right, let's see. Anybody else like like to try some other questions? We still have so many questions. You you should take this opportunity to earn presentation grades. Amir, for the final, can you tell us what we need another time? What do you mean? 14th, right? So last class, we agreed on 14th because I haven't received the departmental schedule. Yeah, we said 14th, right? Which is next, next um, the Monday after next. And also the same time, right? Because not to confuse anybody, we 
We'll do the same time, 7, 10 to 9. Uh, you know, I'll make a post on CUNY Blackboard, then I'll send everyone an email to remind all of us. Okay, anybody has any questions? I really hope some of you to present. Um, all right. Or if anyone has any questions, if anyone confused with any questions on the review sheet, how to do it. Maybe I can go over the question too. Okay, no one wants to present anymore. Okay. Uh, no one has any questions? Okay, if not, I'll see you next Monday, all right? Hopefully next Monday, you'll come up with uh, presentations or questions. Okay, uh, have a good weekend and I'll see you, I'll see you next Monday.